Hi, my name is Jack, and I'd love to share how God called me out of the darkness and brought me into his marvelous light. I'm going to talk about sexual abuse, drug and alcohol addiction, the occult, the new age, eating disorders, self-harm, and a bunch of other stuff that I would love to go in depth on in later videos. But for now, I just want to share the story of what God has done in my life and point to Jesus, who is truly the only savior. So I was born in San Diego and I went to church from as far as I can remember back. I even went to a preschool that was attached to our church. And I thought that everyone in my family was a Christian, including extended family. I just thought that if you were born into a Christian family, you were a Christian. And I didn't have a biblical understanding of who Jesus is. But I believe that Jesus was Lord. I just didn't know what that meant. I didn't really see faith lived out in the lives around me. And I thought Jesus was more of someone to imagine when you were afraid. So I did not have a biblical rooting. Around this time, I was sexually abused. And that was very confusing for me because I developed a crush feelings for the person who abused me and I started being really secretive about what was happening and lying and the person was not an adult. So that made it even more confusing for me. I liked it, I developed a crush on the person and so I knew that it was wrong. I knew that I shouldn't be doing it, but I was, I felt like I was allowing it to happen. I became a very sexual child. I was drawing things and I just remember feeling really, really ashamed of what was going on. Um, the lies, I started lying about it, but then I started lying about more things to cover up what was happening and lie on lie on lie until I really didn't know the truth anymore or I was afraid, so afraid of being found out that I just realized, wow, it's crazy how when you start lying and lying and lying, you have to continue lying to cover up your lies. And it just, um, from a very young age, I started to be really isolated in my sin of lying and just um, in the secrecy of the abuse and the shame and the guilt and everything going on. When I was five, my mom separated from my dad because he had um, drug and alcohol addiction problems. And that was devastating to me because I viewed my dad as a healthy relationship and I loved him. Um, but I also remember being very devastated when he told me that I was his reason for living and that if he lost me, he would die without me and that he had to get sober because he would die if he lost me. And being only five and loving my dad so much, I took that very seriously and to mean that I really was my dad's life. I really was his reason for living and that he really would die if he didn't get sober and lost me. So I took it on myself that it was my responsibility to make sure he stayed sober. I remember calling him at night and if he wouldn't answer, I would feel desperate that I had to keep calling him over and over again because I thought that if he missed my call, he would drink because he'd be sad that he didn't hear from me. And it was just a lot of weight that I felt for that also. During this time, I was starting to see things. The first time I saw lights in the sky, I thought that they were the angels of my dad's best friends that had passed away. My dad's best friends were like father figures to me and I loved them. They both passed away really brutally from addiction and the consequences of their addiction. And so I just assumed when I saw these lights that I saw in the sky that felt so personal and powerful that they must be the angels of my dad's lost ones. Um, but then I found out about aliens and UFOs and I thought, well, that must be what this is because I just felt such a strong personal connection. I felt special that they would come to me, that they would be visiting me. I felt this power and this just a, a personal familiarity with them. And so that added to my isolation because I had all this going on and it was really important to me, but it, I, I felt really misunderstood. When I was seven, my abuser got caught abusing a toddler and was sent away. And I remember just getting a frantic call asking, did he ever touch you? Did anything ever happen? And I was terrified that my entire life up to that point of lies and, and all that had been going on was going to be found out and I was going to be discovered. 
And I was so scared that I told myself that I just couldn't deal with it. I couldn't deal with that pain or pressure and that I was just going to, if I just believed my own lie that it never happened, nothing ever happened. If I could just never think about what had happened or what had been happening again, then it wouldn't be real. And that I could believe my own lie and that I can rewrite my own story and create my own reality. And so I really clung to that. I stuck to my lie that nothing ever happened and I really did anything I could to to hide what had happened, to cover up my shame and to convince myself that I could just never think about it again and that would make it like it never happened. Throughout my childhood, I continued having these alien experiences, believing they're outside of my window at night, feeling this love or this connection for them that I loved, but also being terrified of them. There was this really strong power that was way more powerful than me and I was terrified, but I loved it. And it was this really weird thing, but it opened me up to the, to, to the possibility that there was more out there. Um, which opened up a door for as I got into high school, really throughout junior high and high school, my friendships were my entire life. I found my identity in people because I couldn't be alone with myself. It gave me a way to escape myself and find my identity in people because I didn't even really know who I was, honestly. I had been lying for so long and I just, I didn't even know who I was. So my friendships meant so much to me. I was dealing with, my dad was in this excruciating cycle of the hospital from an overdose or rehab or a way back halfway house or sober, but on the verge of relapse and then back in the hospital and back through the process. And I spent so much time trying to cover up his relapses for my mom because I was so afraid that if she found out he would lose me and then he would die. And it was just a lot um, going on. And when I got to high school, my best friends started to drink um and experiment with drugs and go to parties and that was something that i said i would never do i never wanted to do but the thought of losing my friends who were my escape it just terrified me and it sounds silly now but i just thought it's not worth it to me to be who i really am if that means losing all that i have I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to do drugs because I'd seen firsthand it destroy my dad's life. But I just got to the point that I, that I, I took the loss. And first it was stealing my friend's parents' pills and trying Percocet and things like that. And then it was trying uppers and then it was trying weed and going to parties. And none of it was enough. And it got to the point where I realized I had to drink or else I wasn't going to be invited around anymore. And I just thought I needed that. So I remember vividly the first time I drank where I was, what I drank. I had like a, a half a water bottle of Smirnoff and I drank probably half of that green apple Smirnoff and obviously chugging. I felt it and I, for the first time in my life, I knew I made a huge mistake because I actually escaped the pain. Um, but I knew I didn't want to feel any way but that way for the rest of my life because I actually forgot. So that's basically what I did. Instead of friends being my escape, now drinking, escaping myself through drugs or alcohol became my escape. I started smoking cigarettes at 15, a lot addicted. Um, and really for me, it wasn't if I could drink, it was how I was going to drink. I lived for the next time that I would get high or drunk. It was what was keeping me going. It added to my secret double life because my mom had no idea. Um, I didn't want authority people in my life, authority figures to know what was happening because I was ashamed, but I, I just didn't like who I was and I wanted to escape who I was. And so the friends that I started drinking in the first place to keep, I ended up ditching for friends that went to harder, bigger parties and did harder drugs. And I was just a terrible, selfish friend. All that I cared about was getting my fix and I hated my addiction. And during high school, I got my hands on the book, The Secret. I'd, I would have said I was a Christian at the time when I started drinking and doing drugs, I would have been really offended. And in fact, I was offended when people would insinuate that I wasn't 
because I believed that Jesus was Lord. I just didn't know what that meant. And I definitely lived like the world. I didn't live like Jesus was the Lord of my life. I didn't know what the Bible said. Um, and I didn't want to because I loved my sin and I didn't want to turn. And so God was so faithful to put people in my life who testified of the truth, who testified that I was in sin. And even that brought me to Awana. Um, and I praise God for that. But the truth was that I loved my sin. I loved the darkness because I didn't want to step into the light and have my evil deeds be exposed. And so I continued down this path. Um, I went through a lot of relationships, not really relationships, dating. I was very promiscuous, just waking up so ashamed of what I did, but knowing I would just do it again when I got drunk the next day and gave way more of myself away than I ever intended to. And I was just so miserable, but I didn't want to deal with it. So I just kept seeking the next high or the next time I could escape myself thinking that I could deal with everything later. But for now, I just didn't have the strength to do it. When I got my hands on the secret, it was really empowering to me because it kind of gave a framework for the alien experiences that I'd been having, which I now know were demonic experiences, but then I would have classified it as aliens. And I thought, well, okay, if my thoughts are the most powerful thing in the universe and I create my own reality and the universe is effectually God, then I could at least have a framework that kind of helped me understand what the supernatural experiences I've been having. And it was really alluring to me to think, actually, it was extremely alluring to me to think that I could create my own reality and I can manifest whatever I wanted and anyone could do this. You just had to believe. And I was already honestly living in the delusion that the abuse had never happened. I remember being in fifth grade and having a memory of the abuse and being so mad at myself that I remembered and just being like, man, it's been years and I still remember and I have to push that thought down. I can't believe I haven't forgotten. And so to think, wait, I can have my own reality. I can, I can rewrite my life like Disney, basically. I can make my dreams come true. That was really exciting. So I ate that up and I clung to that and that later um, at least helped me along um, when I started dating a man who was older than me, a few years older, and the first, right when I saw him, I knew I wanted to be with him and I pursued him like crazy and I won him and we started dating and I thought we were in love and that's what love was. It was so exciting. There were such high highs and such low, violent lows. Our relationship was abusive mentally and physically and emotionally and there was a lot of controllingness but I thought he showed me that he loved me when he had outbursts of anger and broke my windshield with his head in frustration and just violence I thought I thought that was his way of showing that he loved me I had such a skewed view of what love was and I didn't have a biblical understanding of reality or love and so that relationship went on I ended up moving up to LA to go to school he would come visit me. I joined a sorority just because I thought I'd fit in more there. And that's kind of what my family had done in the past. And so even in the sorority, I, I was so ashamed because I knew that I wasn't like the other people. I like had a problem that I didn't want to deal with. And I needed to hide the amount that I was drinking or the fact that I was hiding away to smoke cigarettes. And there's just so much shame of this abuse that I wanted to stop, but I felt like I couldn't stop couldn't be alone with my thoughts. Um, in eighth grade, I had already started cutting myself and I developed an eating disorder. I was bulimic when I did eat and I just didn't eat a lot of the time. I lost a ton of weight and that eating disorder I struggled with until just a few years ago. I mean, to be honest, I still struggle with it now, um, but it's just in a more following Christ way of, yeah, it's, it's, sanctification now but that was something that was really hard for me and so um I just I really couldn't be like any way that I can tr could tr control my reality whether it be cutting myself because feeling physical pain to distract myself from the emotional internal anguish gave me some sort of relief that I felt I could control or if I threw up my food like I had control over my own body and my own weight like these illusions of control. And in this relationship with this man, I would be so upset if he was unable to come see me. Like my whole life revolved around him and 
alcohol and drugs. And so I would cut myself because I couldn't, if I couldn't see him, because I couldn't deal with the torturous pain of being alone with my emotions. Um, and I didn't, it was just really bad. And even during this time, I sort of said I was a Christian, but again, I didn't even know what that meant biblically. I didn't know who Christ is. I just had this idea of him, this worldly idea of him that wasn't real. And, and, it, and yeah. And so that relationship went on for a few couple years and then we broke up. And when we broke up, I did not want to break up and it was just painful and violent and I thought I loved him so much. And so I spent that whole summer going to raves and spending it in Vegas and just doing anything to put myself in dangerous situations to escape myself. I tried meth and heroin and it didn't even seem like a big deal. And I was just, I lost even more weight and I was absolutely miserable. And during this time, I met a guy who the second that I met him, I felt so connected to him. It felt like that same deep, dark, but powerful familiarity that I felt the first time that I saw aliens and any other time. And I just felt so connected to him. And he immediately took me out driving by the ocean and was talking to me about aliens and the universe and the stars. And it, it just, it really excited me because in my previous relationship, he was Native American and brought in Native American spirituality and the earth and just kind of adding to my, um, adding on top of my worldview that was going more towards new age, which I didn't know at the time. This boyfriend, as he was talking to me, really like everything he said was so exciting. I didn't realize that he was introducing me to true new age ideology, but I loved it because it was making sense of my experiences. Again, I didn't know the Bible. And so I didn't have the truth, but the small amount that I'd learned when I spent a small amount of time in church, I was trading that away for these lies. He was a drug dealer. He um, was able to buy me alcohol. He wanted me to, he let me move in with him. And even though I wasn't romantically or physically attracted to him, I felt so connected to him and I just moved in right away. Um, I thought that him, he convinced me to quit my job. And I thought that that was like how he, sh he showed that he loved me when really I was just growing dependent on him. He provided drugs and alcohol for me. And by the time I gave myself to him physically and emotionally, everything switched. It went from being kind to me to being really unkind, lying, cheating, um, just treating me like trash. But I thought that he loved me. I was just trying to get back to the way he used to treat me. And I was deeply confused and I'd already become so dependent on him. Um, I believed what he told me, which is that we'd lived hundreds of past lives and in all of them, most of them, we ended up together. We found each other because we we're basically the same soul, but in some of them, we choose to have different experiences. And I just really believed that we were like deeper than twin flames, that we like were each other. And the enemy really used that to, to push me deeper into delusion. When I went back to school, I couldn't think of anything but him when I would be, um, I would think a thought and he'd text me something deep that was around that. And so I just, he became effectually my God to me as I was learning these things. And we had a, our relationship was extremely spiritually and emotionally abusive. Um, man, I was so confused and it was such a dark time in my life that I'd love to go in detail on later, but I just really ate up, um, that ideology and really just dark things, um, allowing dark things, wanting to channel entities doing drugs, doing starting to do psychedelic drugs. He was a DJ. It started at clubs, but then it moved to more Burning Man type small festivals where there was crystal magic and astrology and um, a lot of sexual type tantra, yoga having to do with the Kundalini. Um, and there were just some things that I didn't feel comfortable with, like the sexual openness, liberation. And I believe that it was my Christian dogma, my the my Christian past that was holding me back from being a truly free spirit. And I was so ashamed and annoyed that I couldn't be free and powerful like these people. But I, God was so gracious to give me this restraint that there were some things that I would just feel sick about and I just couldn't do. And that was truly kind. But these things go on today at those festivals. And yeah, so 
I'm being introduced more and more. I'm getting really into crystal magic and just um, astrology and taking it in. There were some things I couldn't do. We end up, things were getting so dark that at this point I remember looking in the mirror and not recognizing whatever was behind my eyes, like whatever being was behind my eyes, my blood ran cold. Like when you run a red light and it's just fear. And thing, it just felt like there was a dark shadow like over my entire life. It was so heavy and so dark. And there was a moment where I believed that God didn't want me to be with this person. And I told God, I don't want what you want. I want what I want, and more or less. And right then, um, my boyfriend looked at me and said, you've never looked as beautiful to me as you do right now. And that, and it was just so dark and it, scary. It was one of the scariest, most sickeningly creepy moments of my life. From that moment on, there was just this heaviness. Like I, it was just dark. That would be a good like overview of our relationship um, and getting into sorcery and stuff like that. And we broke up in a really confusing way where he told me all that he knew was that he loved me. That he was gonna come back for me, but he had to make something of himself and he had to date someone else right away because he loved me more than I loved him and he needed to distract himself. And I knew all of this didn't like add up. I knew how bad it looked, but I wanted to believe that what he taught me, which is that only we understood our connection, that it was outside of time, that it was silly of me to try to expect anyone else to understand. And so, I wanted to believe he told me it would be good for me to keep doing drugs or smoking weed until he came back for me to to kill the pain and um it was just again manipulative but I wanted to believe that that was what love was and I was just so broken um I had just moved to Hollywood and into a studio apartment to be closer to him and I just felt like God had ripped away everything that I wanted I blamed God for taking this person from me. I was so at that point addicted and deluded and I'd lost the plot as I would have put it, like out of my mind. Um, I believed that my ex could always see me. I, it was just really dark. And so I got to a point where I just felt like, man, um, it's over for me. <laughs> I, my dad was homeless. Like I just felt like I totally lost control and I was mad at God and I just thought, hey, you know, I want to be free and powerful like those people. I'm tired of this restraint. I'm just going to go full in to this. And so that's when I really snapped and I just decided to go into it. And so these beings, I was continuing to have supernatural experiences. These beings, these spirit guides were guiding me to certain things to where things would physically glow and I would know that was the thing. And it was like every number, every sound was a sign that I was following I still thought I could have Christ and this, but I was really starting to, I really at this point had decided that Christ was not real, definitely not the only way. And I believe more in a Christ consciousness that we're all divine and that we can just ascend to a level where we can be awakened enough to really understand that we are all God. And it's just a lie, ultimately the first lie, but um, sounds a lot like Satan and I believed it or I wanted to, even though I had a feeling Satan was behind it, but I got, I just went full into what I was being led to, which ended up being both tarot cards and, um, just a lot of Masonic literature and, um, Kabbalah and astrology and, um, magic and just obsessively spending all my hours just obsessing over astral projection and lucid dreaming and these tarot cards and divination and that was my life and so it was just wicked and dark and I couldn't hold a conversation with people because I was just out of my mind and this went on for a while where everything was just a sign and a symbol and everywhere I looked it, it was just bad I saw his face and it was terrifying this went on for years until I believed that I was being called by these entities. I was having just crazy supernatural experiences. Um, and I believed I was being called by them to this order on the back of my tarot cards. I knew that my tarot cards were made by Aleister Crowley, who was known to be one of the most wicked men or the most wicked man to have ever lived. Um, but I just made all these justifications as to how what I was doing wasn't wrong. 
God was so kind to give me conviction that I, I knew that Satan was behind what I was doing, but I was so prideful and I made so many justifications. Like I wasn't doing black magic, I was doing white magic, or I just had a more ascended view of who Christ is, just lies. And so I told myself that the tarot cards can be evil. Things only have energy that you put into them. And, and I just, I was making excuses, but on the back of these tarot cards, made by Aleister Crowley was the name of an order called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. I had already been really drawn to Hermetics um, and Hermeticism and all the things tied into that. And it made so much sense and I felt so, it was like a lust, like this deep alluring temptation, ultimately being carried away and enticed by my own lust to join this order. I kept not, but being called, pulled back to it. And then ultimately I ended up reaching out to them. I met up with a guy at a coffee shop and everything that he told me that we would be doing was exactly what these entities had been leading me to from astrology to alchemy to everything. Um, and so I was very excited. He told me to meet him, to be initiated that I had you know, been called to this and be initiated to meet him at a Freemason lodge that was in LA. And so I wasn't scared. I was so prideful. I was so excited. I was gaining all this power to have control over the universe. I was gonna, I don't know, be able to control my life. And so um, drove there, so excited, listened to Fantasmic on the way, just like pumped. Cause everything made sense now, all the symbolism. And I got there and I just remember it was dark. I remember how it smelled in there. And there was a woman, like at the top of the stairs in a black robe and it was just so ominous. They put me in a black robe. They put me in this little prayer room where I was to meditate or pray. Um, I don't remember what verbiage they used, but they, I remember hearing the sound of men and women yelling in the ritual room. I remember them tying my hands with cords and me having a hoodwink put over my head and then being initiated um, through this initiation ritual into the golden dawn. And it was so dark, but I was so excited that I was finally going to gain this power to have control over my life. And, and it was so exciting to me. And so I continued going there. Um, still tell by at this point, there were so many scary things going on. And I actually joined the order because they told me that I could be a Christian and be in it. Um, you could be any religion and be in it much like how Freemasons say, you just have to believe in a higher power. Um, and their symbol was at a cross. So I just all these justifications I made that I could be right before God and do these things, which were lies, but I bought them. I really thought I could still be good with Christ, even though deep down I knew I couldn't. And so I was justifying everything I was doing as we were doing the Eucharist, but to Osiris and all these Egyptian deities that I had been led to be obsessed with for the past year or two, maybe three. It was just like this, so excited, but it was so dark and I was moving up. I was told I was moving up so quickly and yet I was just as depraved as ever. I was absolutely wicked, wicked and just having terrifying things happen to me, which they said would happen and we were given ban banishing rituals and all these things. I was spending hours every morning doing rituals and meditations and oh, so many works. And I really wanted to have these experiences with these aliens and these spirit guys. I felt so special for it. I, I got to the point where I wanted them to see, I believed they wanted to see through my eyes. I, and I mean, like enter me. Like I, I thought they wanted to use my body or see through my eyes. And I, it, it's crazy now thinking back, but then I just had experiences where I really believe I was possessed and I, I shouldn't have been surprised because I was asking for, it, but in the moment, I didn't realize that's what I was asking for. I thought I was doing something noble or I thought I was special because they wanted to use me. It was so dark, but I just realized like, so the order used Kabbalah, which is taking the Bible and well, they use the Bible in multiple ways, but it was all twisted and taken out of context. But because they were using the Bible, I was like, well, I just read the Bhagavad Gita. I'm going to read the Bible and just, you know, take from all these religious scriptures. 
you know, this whole time God was awesome and faithful and just, I had no peace. Like it wasn't like I was in this order and felt joy or peace or anything. There were sermons I'd be driving and something would come on and just little seeds that the Lord was using to plant in my life. And I read that you can tell a tree by its fruit. I read in the Bible. I didn't even know what that meant, but I knew that the fruit of this order and the leaders, they were just as depraved as me, that it was bad fruit. And so that was like, really would bother me because I, I couldn't shake it with other things. It's like I read so, so much, but God's word like didn't return void. It was accomplishing what he willed successfully in me. And then I read that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. And that was like, really upset and shocked and amazed because the whole time I felt like deep down, I knew that Satan was behind it, but I kept telling myself, no, this is light work. How can it be dark if we're shining the light of knowledge? The dark isn't really dark. You need to shine the light of knowledge in it. It's just a lack of knowledge. Lies, but I believed them. And then reading that, I was like, I just knew like that Satan was behind it. And then one night in my apartment, um, I just remembered Genesis 3, the when we're introduced to Satan in the garden. And what he says is, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. And I realized that was exactly the lie that I had bought. I believe that if that, that was the whole occult premise that I believe that if I eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'll become like God, I'll gain the power, I'll gain this, this is the secret, these are the secret mystery ancient, these are the secret ancient mystery schools. Like that, and it blew my mind that it didn't, le it didn't, it didn't give them what Satan promised, it led to the fall. And that's what it was leading into to in my life because it, it's a lie. And I was just like, I didn't even fall for some new fangled lie. Like this is the original lie in the garden and I fell for it. And that's what it's leading to in my life is the fall. During this time, first off, I, yes, I realized Satan was behind it, but I was still too prideful to turn. God is amazingly loving and merciful that throughout this, I'm talking about how faithful God was and how sinful I was. And yet I'm amazed by his mercy and grace like that is who God is, who he says he is too. It's amazing. But during this time, my grandpa came and visited and I hadn't seen him in years. And he just sat me down and said, what's your relationship with God like? And I said, it's amazing. I'm just, uh, you know, I thought I was like so much on a higher frequency than other people. I was gaining the secret knowledge of the secret ancient Egyptian Babylonian mystery schools and I was saying yeah I'm reading parts of the all these different religious texts and he just looked me square in the face and said Jesus is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except through him and I don't remember if he said you will die in your sins if you don't believe Jesus like in Jesus as the only way to be saved or if that's just what that John 14, 6, like I knew that was the implication, the, the truth of it. But I was so mad that he would have the audacity to judge me and say that. But it didn't matter what I thought because God used that and I was shaking because I knew it was true. Some th God's word just didn't return void. And so even though I continued going to the Freemason Lodge and practicing sorcery and witchcraft, that was just wouldn't let me go. Like I just would remember that. And it, it was like, it was really bothering me because I knew it was true. And so then these Bible verses adding to that, I still am not turning because I'm so prideful. And then one night in my studio apartment, it was like any other night, I was walking across my apartment and I was attacked and I fell to my knees and it felt like my soul was just being sucked out of me into complete darkness. And I heard myself scream, Jesus Christ, save me. And it was amazing because I didn't expect myself to say that, but when I did, I meant it. And in that moment, I knew that the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had saved me, like just like that. And I was stunned. And 
I knew that everything that I'd been doing and convincing myself wasn't actually bad. I knew that it was a sin. I knew that everything that I'd been reading in the Bible about sorcery being an abomination, like I knew that God's word was true and that I was wrong and that I had sinned against this God that had saved me. And I knew that there was no other power, like all this power and all these secrets I'd been learning was literally nothing compared to the power of God. And neither was the darkness. It was not, God delivered me like that and just... I was just stunned and I was shaking and I got out my Bible that was under my bed because I'd been dealing with terrifying supernatural experiences, including painful alien abduction experiences that were embarrassing and just bad. And so I was scared, but I was prideful. But now I took out the Bible and I started reading it. And at first I still thought I had this secret knowledge, but as I was reading it, I just, it was like, for years I've been reading and reading and everything left me hungrier and thirstier and emptier. But for the first time as I'm reading God's word, I'm being filled and satisfied and re I recognized it as truth. And so I just kept reading. And as I was reading, I was changing from the inside out. And that stunned me because I had done hours of works and rituals and all this work to change my life. And it was all a delusion. It was all like fake but this was actually changing me god through this faith i had in him well and i didn't do anything to deserve it at all i just had faith i believe that jesus is who he says he is in the bible and i was it was i'm still stunned at how real it is And so by the time I finished reading the Bible, or maybe even a bit before, I realized that I could get sober. And I, I wish I could put in words how stunning that was for me because I thought I'd ruin my life and that I would never, ever be able to get sober. And yet I did, and it wasn't easy. But when the withdrawals and the cravings would come, I would cling to the Lord and he was so faithful. I would read his word and he'd speak to me through his word and I'd pray to him and it was so personal and intimate. It was so kind. It was amazing. And I got sober and I was listening to sermons online that were convicting me of sin. God was so kind to allow me to find a faithful church that I had just heard on the radio where a pastor preaching and I didn't know it was a pastor. That's another story, but I ended up finding a church that was so lovely. And the pastor was so patient to just sit with me. I still thought I could be in the order and be a Christian. And so I was going to church, I'm still in this order. Um, but the pastor was so faithful that he would preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the word of God but also that he sat with me and like when I really was struggling with things, he would just point me back to scripture and walk me through it, even if it was harsh sounding, even if I didn't like it, he didn't try to candy coat it so that it wouldn't offend me. He just hit me with the truth and sometimes it did offend me, but that doesn't matter because it's the truth and God was just so gracious. So I got to a point there where I just, the Lord really just was awesome and used his word and the preaching of his word to convict me of sin until I realized I, I needed to, cho to choose, like I needed to forsake everything and follow Jesus. Like I can't follow Jesus with, while still thinking it's okay to practice astrology or be in this order or do any, like my life is not my own anymore. He has saved me. And like in that moment, when I, when the Lord saved me um, from in that moment in my studio apartment, like I felt a peace that I'd been looking for my entire life, my entire life, I had, I had peace. And it was awesome. And it still is awesome because his peace has never left me because it's his spirit. It's so cool. I didn't think I would get like so emotional or amazed, but it really is so incredible. But anyway, I, I realized I had to choose, well, God chose me, but I had to turn and really renounce everything and follow him. And so I told the order that I'd be leaving, which they say, you can't leave, you can only step away. And so I 
stepped away and I stopped practicing magic and astrology and I got baptized. Well, first I publicly confessed my life to the Lord and I was baptized to publicly confess that I belong to the Lord. And, um, and, ah, oh, it's just been so amazing. Like, especially because I don't deserve this. I know that I deserve hell. Like, that's not a question for me. I was absolutely wicked, like awfully wicked. And I rebelled against God and he saved me. God is holy. Like he's perfect and holy and good. And I rebelled against my creator, my perfect, holy, good God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve for my sin, death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. How does a perfect, holy, righteous God who is just, perfectly just, so he has to punish sin, he has to do the, the just thing, how can someone like me who blatantly rebelled against him and chose my sin over him over and over again and was just desperately wicked above all else, how could, how could he reconcile me to himself while still being a just God? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is amazing. God became man. Jesus was truly God, truly man. He came and was born to a virgin, lived a perfect life that none of us could ever live. And he died on the cross. And on the cross, he bore the sins, our sins. He bore our sin for us and he bore God's wrath, the judgment that we deserved for us in our place. He was buried and he rose on the third day. And now he is seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. He, Jesus Christ is the one and only mediator between God and man. That's amazing. And so if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so we have to repent, meaning turn away from our sin, truly change our mind and believe that what God says about our lives and our sin is right and we're wrong and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and and will be saved. And, and that's what the Lord did in my life. I was baptized. I, um, long story, <laughs> hopefully shorter. I became the worship director at my small church. And that was just such a blessing. The first time I sang worship to God, I was like, this is why I sing my whole life. I sang, but I didn't know why. And the first time I sang praise to the Lord, like, I was like, this is why I have a voice. Like, Jesus is everything. This is why I exist. It was so awesome. So I got to praise. My dad was saved. My dad was saved at the age of 69. Saved. He's been sober for the longest time in his life. But most importantly, he is content. He has peace. He has the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has been such a blessing and a gift to see him grow in the Lord, knowing that I don't have him. His sobriety is not in my hand. He belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has joy and it's so cool. And I got to worship, praise the Lord and lead worship with my dad. How awesome is that? And then um, I served there for a couple of years and God was so faithful and kind that he allowed me opportunities. Well, the opportunity to, to go to a school and to share my testimony and just proclaim that the Lord has called me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. He's excellent. He's amazing. And then the Lord, which is a whole other story, called me out of Hollywood, which was so hard for me to let go of, and to Arizona. I had no idea why. I didn't had never been to this small town. It's not really that small. I'd never been here, and I just believed it was the Lord's will for me to move here. I moved here, and it has been such a gift. I'm now at a church that is so faithful by God's grace and preaches the word and ah, uh, and I'm on staff at a church where I get to be just under the leadership of pastors that love the Lord that hold to the sufficiency of scripture um 
man, God has redeemed my life. I can't, I'm, I'm stunned and there's so much more, but I want to cut this a bit shorter. The Lord has changed my life. And even if he'd done none of those things in terms of like physical gifts or these, bl these blessings that he's done on top of, even if my life had gotten significantly worse, the real gift that I received is Jesus Christ. He, and he's the best gift I could ever receive. The true victory in this whole story is what God did. He saved me. He saved me when I was dead in my sin. And he can save you. And so again, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the truth. You won't find it anywhere else. You need a savior. You will never be able to save yourself. And there is no other savior but Jesus Christ. So... I hope that this is encouraging. Again, I plan to make videos. I, Lord willing, really, really hope to make videos more in depth on these topics. And so if you'd like to see that, if you're interested in that, please do subscribe. Um, and know that I'm praying for you who are watching this. I'm going to pray again right now. And I just, I really pray that the Lord um, would use this and other things in your life to point you to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm so thankful.